What would Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi really have looked like? And what is the simple truth that nobody in the art world wants you to know about that painting? Would it have looked more like the painting on the left, the fully restored version by Diane Modestini, which sold in Christie's auction for $450 million? Or would it more resemble the digital recreation on the right by some random internet person? Chances are you've seen this painting before coming to this video, and you may have been struck that there's something not quite right about it. There's something off, not just peculiar, not just a little bizarre, but just something fishy. And you might have done some research and got the runaround and spectacular diatribes that address all sorts of provenance and the science of the materials and the underlying paintings and the wood, but somehow they seem to never address certain issues or problems that are self-evident just by looking at it. If you've had this feeling like there's something they're not telling you and it's looking right at you, you've come to the right place. Before I launch into my analysis, I'd like to give you a little hint, a clue, something to mull over, cud to chew, if you will. There are two propositions that we think of as mutually exclusive, but which are not. The first is that Leonardo painted this in the early 1500s, and it's all by him. And the second is Leonardo did not paint that face. Both of these propositions can be true simultaneously. In the remainder of the video, I will discuss the purely visual issues with the painting. The clean state, that's after overpainting had been removed and before any more changes or alterations would happen. Then the arguments for and against authenticity, my version of the clean state before I digitally painted over it. Then I'll address the elephant in the room, which is the truth they don't want you to know. Then comes the emperor's new canvas, which is that we accept the painting as authentic even after we know about the elephant in the room because everyone else does. After that, we have my final recreation and then finally the backlash people have received or fear for speaking out. When I first saw the Salvatore Mundi years ago, I was immediately struck, but I wasn't awestruck. I wasn't dazzled by its sublimity. Leonardo is known relative to his peers for his exacting detail. He'd spend years on one painting. He was known for his naturalism and his virtuosity. There's that famous story where his teacher, Verrocchio, upon seeing his workmanship, put his own brush down and declared he would never paint again. And Verrocchio was not only an astounding sculptor, but an excellent painter and draftsman. And then here's this painting, and what immediately impressed me about it was how awkward it was, and a cornucopia of anatomical errors. First and foremost, there's an enormous problem with the eyes. They're misaligned. The left eye is lower than the right eye and conspicuously bigger. The eyes look off in different directions. The upper eyelid of the left eye is different from the one of the right because the lines articulating its top and bottom never meet. They run off parallel. This is not the case with the other eye and it is peculiar. Allow me to go on a bit of a tangent here. It's entirely relevant as to the fact that the main art critics never mention the problem with the eyes. In this book review by Charles Hope of January 2020, he discusses this. But why is a deep familiarity with Leonardo's ideas more relevant to reaching the kinds of judgment required to assess the Salvatore Mundi than the expertise of, say, a trained artist? 
As it happens, only one of the Leonardo specialists who have written about the picture, not one of those consulted by the National Gallery, has commented on the fact that Christ's eyes are not at the same level, a basic error one would not expect to find in a painting by Leonardo. Many art historians seem to believe that artistic training is irrelevant to the practice of connoisseurship, but this attitude merely facilitates the activity of forgers. The knowledge that the art historian can contribute is of a different kind, involving issues such as the study of provenance and familiarity with available information about the work of Leonardo's assistants and followers. Yes, uh, their artists are left out of it. It's kind of like, who can speak intelligently about boxing? Muhammad Ali? Or Howard Cosell? Well, in this situation, it's all Howard Cosell and no Muhammad Ali. I'm not sure that there's anybody left, really, for you to fight. You. That may come about someday. Thank you for coming Just on. stay in shape. The nose veers off to the left like a hockey stick, and the tip of the nose is just a little bit grotesque. It seems misshapen. So does the mouth. The protuberance in the upper lip is a bit exaggerated and wide, and it veers to Christ's right of the tip of his nose, so the nose and mouth are also misaligned. His left cheek is a different shape from his right cheek. The left cheek is more convex and the right cheek concave. The right jawbone is quite large on his right side, and it's the opposite on his left side. He has no throat, and the neck is not discernible. It's just curtained by hair on the sides. His left thumb is cut off by the edge of the panel, which is a very strange compositional choice. You wouldn't cut off just the tip of the thumb, and the knuckles of his left hand meet the edge of the picture plane, which is also going to attract a lot of attention to itself for no reason, and is very awkward. The only thing that looks good is his right hand, except for the thumb, which is a bit bulbous and non-committal. I can't tell what angle it's supposed to be at. The fabric of his clothing seems flat. In some places, it's merely outlines. Taking all these things into consideration, I did not get the impression at all that this was a real Leonardo. And then I came across something that completely changed my mind. No, it wasn't an academic study about the provenance of the painting, who had owned it, at what time, who sold it to who, for how much money. It wasn't about the chemical analysis of the underlying layers of paint or the kind of grains in the wood, the knot, that it was made of oak. Rather, it was one single photograph of all the photographs of this painting, and it was the painting in the clean state, after the previous overpaintings had been removed and before any additional restoration and retouching. In this state, the painting looks like a broken, damaged masterpiece. The areas that do exist that look like a finished painting are highly defined and show a lot of evidence of skill. The modeling is very complex and convincing and realistic. And then other areas are just clearly damaged or abraded. There's layers of paint missing. These aren't the clumsy mistakes I thought they were. It's physical damage to the painting. The photo of the painting at this state is the best and most compelling evidence that this is the real deal, a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. It is also, however, the best evidence that in its current state, it is not. Anything is possible, but the odds are astronomically against it.
Before we get started, you need to know, if you don't already, that there are as many as 20 to 30 different contemporaneous paintings of the Salvatore Mundi. For convenience sake, I will refer to the subject of the video as the Modestini version after the Restorer. It was formerly called the Dubai and the New York version, also the Cook version after prior owner, but since its current whereabouts are not fully certain or permanent, it makes more sense to connect the painting to the Restorer. Of the extant versions of the Salvatore Mundi I can find online, only a half dozen aren't so ridiculous that they couldn't be by Leonardo. They are all believed to be based on a single cartoon or outline drawing by Leonardo himself, which is why they share the same basic composition. While the cartoon is not known to exist, there are a couple preparatory sketches by Leonardo himself, which are the only hard evidence he was at all involved in the project of making a painting of the Salvatore Mundi. Indeed, when the Modestini version was shown in the National Gallery in the blockbuster 2011 Leonardo da Vinci show, it was hung between the two drawings. Some people may have doubts because it is such a strange and compelling image, but I have to say I'm very convinced by it. An ordinary painter wouldn't have presented a Christ quite as spooky as this. It's also significantly been endorsed by Valdemar Gen... Gen... by Valdemar as so spooky it just must be authentic. Nobody seemed bothered that the painting doesn't match either of the sketches. The sleeve is completely different and there's no overlap between the tunics. It is enough to know that Leonardo made preparatory sketches of a fairly high quality and that certain sections of the painting are also of a similar high quality of rendering. Curiously, another version of the Salvatore Mundi by an anonymous follower of Leonardo is based explicitly on those sketches. However, this one is not seen as a candidate, possibly because the rendering is much more crude in comparison. Next up is an etching made of the Salvatore Mundi by Wenceslaus Haller in 1650. And it is unfortunate that the given name Wenceslaus has fallen out of favor in recent years. The Latin inscription on the bottom asserts that the etching is after the original Leonardo painting. This provides further evidence that there was a Leonardo painting to begin with of the Salvatore Mundi, as well as what it looked like. There are certainly strong similarities with the Modestini version, and this helps establish it as by Leonardo himself. There are, however, dissimilarities as well. As Michael Daly pointed out in the November 12, 2018 issue of Artwatch UK Online, Haller's Christ was stouter and heavily bearded. His face was long and it tapered inwards from the level of the eyes. It did not widen, chipmunk-like, towards the jaw. The eyes looked slightly to our left, not directly at the viewer. A radiant halo-like light emitted from Christ's head. The transparent orb had gathered light around its circumference and not grown darker as in the painting. This does raise the specter that the etching could be of a different version of the Salvatore Mundi. I conducted a bit of my own experiment in Photoshop to help us figure this out. Let's compare the Wenceslaus Haller etching to the various versions of the Salvatore Mundi. I've overlapped it on top of them and sized it approximately. This isn't about my accuracy of resizing it, and it doesn't fit any of them proportionally exactly. Because I gather Wenceslaus Haller looked at it and copied it, he didn't do a tracing. Alright, the first one here on the upper left is the Ganet version, and it's a fairly good approximation. The proportions are different and all that, but that's going to be the case with all of them. The one, there are two conspicuous differences here. One is that the Ganet is an uncropped version of the Salvatore Mundi. I'll talk about this more later. Uh, the other difference is with the fabric here, where these two bands traverse, and the Ganet version has the fabric folding over, and this one is straight up and down. This version... Um, the biggest difference is he very conspicuously has no beard, and this one does. So they are very different. This also has the folded fabric here, 
And I'll just point out now, look at this treatment of the fabric. It's very, it's almost abstract. It's not naturalistic at all. And then we have this one. Again, we have this, this fold like in the Leonardo drawing, which is missing in the Wenceslaus version. He does have the full beard and mustache. The main difference is in the patterning and the decoration on these bands, which is completely different. This one is the GM Pietrino version. We actually know who the artist is who made it. And this is the nicest fit in terms of proportion. He does have bizarre eyes looking in opposite directions. He's the most wall-eyed version of the Salvatore Mundi. And even though the proportions are the closest, again, he has very different patterns on these straps. So that makes it a different painting. Then we come to the Modestini version. And there are two differences here that are outstanding. One being that, as Michael Daly pointed out, this one has a very pronounced beard where the Modestini version has perhaps the suggestion of a beard. You can't really tell if he has one or not, but this could be due just to prior restorations and damage to the painting. Maybe he originally had a beard. The other difference is that the fabric here is perfectly straight, and in this one, it goes over the band, and it's got some folds in it. I'm also assuming we lost all the modeling on the folds, which is why we just see the outlines. There's more modeling over here, and it's much more convincing. So this is a pretty good fit, and this one, I can't even take this one seriously. I just put it in to have six. It looks kind of ridiculous to me, and the tunic is completely different. There are no transverse bands. So I would say that the Wenceslaus Haller fits the Modestini version the best. One point for arguments for its authenticity. This is, of course, giving Wenceslaus Haller the benefit of the doubt that he knew if he was making an etching after a real Leonardo or not. And we are also allowing that there are definitely differences between the Haller version and the Modestini version, but compared to the other ones, they are less. Though one can make a case for the Gagné version. There is also the possibility that there's another version out there which matches perfectly, but has since disappeared. Next up is the Pentimento. At one stage in the cleaning of the painting, two thumbs became visible, evidence that the artist who created the painting had changed his mind. Let's let Martin Kemp explain it. He is the most high-profile proponent that the painting is 100% an autograph, Leonardo. Take it away, Kempmeister! What emerged during the restoration were various signs saying, this is the original of Leonardo, it's battered, but it's the real thing. Um, there was a pentimento in the thumb. All the copies use the turned in thumb, but there's a ghost emerged of a, more, of a straighter thumb. Doesn't mean it's by Leonardo, but it's useful, as it suggests that it's not simply a mechanical copy. Evidence that the artist who created the painting changed his mind during the process is not evidence that this didn't happen in any of the other paintings. I don't know if that's the case or not. It's also not evidence that the same person painted both thumbs. However, as the Kempmeister points out, it points in the right direction. And then there's the issue of the palm print. Let's allow the Kempmeister to address it himself. Leonardo's technique was very unusual, and even the boys don't seem to have picked this up. He would use, he's left-handed, so he would put the heel of his right hand into the paint uh, to soften it as it's drying, to get these very uh, soft tonal transitions. It makes me wonder if there are palm prints on multiple Leonardo paintings, can they be cross-referenced to determine if they are the same palm? In which case, we'd have definitive evidence that the hand of Leonardo was at work on this Salvatore Mundi. 
While the palm print doesn't prove it was the master's own palm and not that of one of his students, it does narrow the range of candidates a bit more convincingly to at least his school. Our next bits of evidence come from a New York Times article of April 11th, 2021. Incidentally, the article asserts that the Crown Prince of Saudi had secretly shipped the Salvatore Mundi to the Louvre in 2018, thus establishing finally its whereabouts. One needs to know that there are different levels of attribution. Full attribution indicates that Leonardo is responsible for 100% of the painting. It's all done by his own hand. This is also called an autographed piece. Partial attribution, which many people are arguing for, means that Leonardo worked on it, but he didn't do the whole thing. Perhaps his students worked on it in his workshop, which was often the case with old masters at the time. Here are their main bits of evidence. Experts at the Center for Research and Restoration of the Museums of France and Independent Culture Ministry Institute used fluorescent x-rays, infrared scans, and digital cameras aimed through high-powered microscopes to match signature details of the materials and artistic techniques in the Salvatore Mundi with the Louvre's other Leonardo masterpieces. The thin plank of wood on which the Salvatore Mundi was painted was the same type of walnut from Lombardy that Leonardo used in other works. The artist had mixed fine powdered glass in the paint, as Leonardo did in his later years. Traces of hidden painting under the visible layers, details of the locks of Christ's hair, and the shade of bright vermilion used in the shadows all pointed to the hand of Leonardo, the report concluded. All these arguments tend to favor the idea of an entirely autographed work, said one of the two curators. The Louvre president was even more definitive. The results of the historical and scientific study presented in this publication allow us to confirm the attribution of the work to Leonardo da Vinci. I noticed just a couple things about this in relation to the entirely autographed work. Well, for one, the curator merely says that the arguments tend to favor the idea of an entirely autographed work. They don't prove it. I got the impression when I first read this that this was evidence that the Salvatore Mundi was not not by Leonardo. It's on a kind of oak panel that he used. Does this mean that other artists didn't use similar oak panels or that his own students wouldn't use such an oak panel in his own workshop? The same goes for the powdered glass and the paint. Did only Leonardo use that paint or did his students use the same paint? when practicing his techniques under his tutelage. Let's give the benefit of the doubt to the idea that only Leonardo used this powdered glass and only Leonardo used these panels. Even so, they never address the elephant in the room, which I will get to later. Onward to the authentication by connoisseurship, which is estimating the validity of the painting in terms of its inherent quality how refined or eloquent the technique is, and how closely it resembles other works by the same artist. In the case of the Modestini Salvatore Mundi, in its best elements, it surpasses the other versions. Several critics and historians have remarked on the quality of the curls, and once again, let's let the Kempmeister take the microphone. Um, the quality of the picture, let's go in and look at what's happening. Some of it is just astonishing. And it's astonishing in a way that is Leonardo rather than anybody else. And Leonardo, you can see that his hair is painted with absolutely fizzing brilliance, um, enormous dexterity and rhythmic quality. And when you look at Leonardo's curls, the boys could do perfectly good curls for the use of. You know, they could do the, do the curly bit. But Leonardo's have a kind of anatomy to them, a sense of structure, which is his science of art. I mostly agree with Martin Kemp in this regard. In doing my own version of the Salvatore Mundi, I had a lot of trouble with the curls. A lot of the difficulty is because the way Leonardo renders them is not exactly naturalistic. It's somewhere between naturalistic and stylistic. They have an element of corkscrews about them or wood shavings or ribbons. So the difficult part is getting some of that structure down with variation 
and also being able to do a gradation between the straighter hair on the top of his head to the curliest on the bottom. There has to be a convincing segue. And on his left side, there was nothing there to go by in the original painting, so I had to make it all up. Eventually, I just gave up and winged it, more or less. Let's look at the six contenders to make a comparison of the curls and other parts. First, let's look at the Modestini version. This is not as good of a photo. There's several different photos and none of them are wonderful somehow. You'd think Christie's would have an absolutely beautiful one. Uh, in this area, I spoke of, this is not exquisite Leonardo curls here. Look at these, these strands here. They're pretty, uh, simple, awkward, just a curvy sort of line. It kind of meanders almost randomly. Where on this side, it's so structured in some parts that it really looks like a ribbon. I would almost say that's too stylized, and especially right in this area. Hair may do that, but this side does not compare to this side. Now let's look at some uh, what other people did. In this version, you can't really see it. It doesn't look good. It looks like macaroni over on this side. You can't tell for sure. In the Ganet version, it looks pretty good. I'm not so fond of this area. Uh, he's got a lot of individual strands coming out. It's, it's pretty good, but not as good. This one, the uh, curls are ridiculous. They really look like ribbons. They're too much the same structure. They're formulaic. And look at this thing. Is this the end of a violin? What is this? Come on. And then we can get into this one. We can't really see it. It's black and white. I'd love to see this one in color, but we'll have to do with the black and white. And this one, you can't really tell. The next area that impresses me is this part of the hand, wrist, and sleeve, which is the most well-preserved area of the whole painting. I want to point out something on the hand. Look at these wrinkles here. The way he did this transition to suggest the wrinkles is he used a highlight and a shadow. And this shadow has a gradation down where it meets the highlight and that creates the wrinkle. He doesn't just draw a line. Compare that to the other ones. This one, which is in some ways, one of the much better hands attempts to do the same thing, but it's more obvious and he has more of a line going through. That's the second best one. This one, we can't tell so much. It's more exaggerated. We come to this one. It's more cartoonish. It seems, it, it's hard to tell in this black and white. We look at this one, something horrible is going on with this finger here. These finger, this finger looks cut out. And look at this one. You're seeing the underside of this middle finger here, but at the top, you're seeing the top of the finger. So this finger's really bent. If we look at the Ganet version, uh, he did not do these wrinkles as well on the palm. There's, it's very different. It's a whole different level of expertise. And these fingernails are facing too forward, as is this one. So the prize goes to this version of the Salvatore Mundi for having a whole different level of expertise in rendering the hand, the lighting and shading, and the sophistication of the curls and that combination of stylization and naturalization. However, while trying to do the hair, I did a lot of research. I was trying to find examples of Leonardo's drawings. Here's some babies he did. A little different because the baby's curls are not long cascading curls, but I did try and study these. I looked for his, his mentor, Verrocchio, and I looked at his students. But while doing this, I came across this fellow. Look at these curls. These are quite good and he makes them go into the scalp in individual hairs. This is very naturalistic. Look at these here, very subtle, intertwining. He's doing one hair at a time in some places. The beard is really technical. I would not want to have to try to reproduce this beard. On this woman, the hair is also quite good. This, this almost has like that, uh, that's, 
intertwining snakes look about it. But these are very, very high quality curls and hair in my considered opinion. I mean, judge for yourself. This is by Andrea Salerio, who is one of Leonardo's students or followers. I have heard no one suggest that he painted the Salvatore Mundi, but we'll come back to him. For now, let's just agree that the Modestini Salvatore Mundi has the best details, and that does work in favor of authenticity. And, uh, yeah, I was contacted by Christie's, uh, and they said, oh, the, you know, the Salvatore Mundi is coming up for sale, and they were obviously looking for me to support it as a as a Leonardo. I did a video for them. I said, I'm not getting involved in the sale process. Fascinating. The last argument for authenticity I'm going to cover is my favorite, and I hope it will be yours too. It is the authentication via religious experience. That might sound a little hyperbolic. We could say transcendent experience, or ecstatic communion with painting, or profound emotional reaction, or feeling of proximity to the divine. You will see. Let me give you some prime examples, starting with art historian and dealer Robert B. Simon. This is an article from The Guardian, and Simon is quoted as saying this. For me, the most compelling reason to believe in the painting is neither scholarly nor scientific. It comes from its sense of profound spirituality that is conveyed from artist to viewer across 500 years. It may be worth noting that Robert Simon is a New York art historian who bought the Salvatore Mundi at auction for just $1,175 in 2005, before it was attributed to Leonardo in 2011. <laughs> Don't get the wrong impression. I am by no means against people having transcendent sorts of experiences, including in relation to art, or especially in relation to art. I may even have made some images myself, which some say have spiritual overtones, such as my transfiction from around 15 years ago, or another of my early digital paintings, Death, Disillusion, and the void. I even wrote an article in the defense of the transcendent in art called The Spiritual in Art for the Intellectually Rigorous. I do question, however, if attestations of transcendent type experiences in response to art are used cynically or manipulatively as a means to bolster the legitimacy and monetary value of a select piece of art. To continue, Here's art critic Alistair Soup in a promotional video by Christie's. And here, suddenly you're stopped in your tracks and it sucks you towards it. It has this quiet aura. And it's really quite humbling and moving to be confronted by this. So face to face. We're brought right up close next to divinity itself. Jesus, I am overjoyed to meet you face to face. You've been getting quite a name all around the place. And this is our curator, Bill Heydrich, eloquently articulating what have come to be the dominant conclusions about this painting in the art industry. This is an enormously powerful image. There is a tranquility there is a, an immediacy, a presence, that we are drawn, being drawn into the space of this, however you want to look at it, as Christ or an individual. Um, there is something very balanced with the orb. It's interesting, it's comforting, it's solid, 
and that hand is just so calm, so peaceful, and it combines with the presence of the face, uh, I think to just create an extraordinary iconic image, uh, one of the great images in Western art. Why? Sure spreading that arm thick. Bill Heydrich set the bar impressively high in terms of lavishing praise on the Salvador Mundi, but I think our old friend, the Kempmeister, can take it even further. Leonardo's have a presence, and they have that kind of living presence, as if they're not just made out of pigment. It was immediately apparent that it was a strange picture. It has this uncanny quality to it, which particularly the later Leonardo's tend to have. It has this quality in a way that the Mona Lisa has, that there is an emotion there, there's a sense that the figure is looking at you and reacting and you're reacting. It's a very elusive emo emotion, it's got that mysterious quality. It's an exercise in, in the ineffable, in the, in the spiritual, in the inaccessible, as well as something we can see. Here are 30 useful words for conveying the mystical nature hewn into the living paint of the Salvatore Mundi. Aura, balanced, calm, comforting, divinity, elusive, emotional, enormously, extraordinary, great, humbling, iconic, immediacy, inaccessible, Ineffable, interesting, living, moving, mysterious, peaceful, powerful, presence, profound, quiet, solid, spiritual, strange, tranquility, uncanny, and ungainly. And only the last one was added by yours truly. It may be in some ways the most accurate, but just keep that between us. All this talk about the ineffable, the uncanny, the extraordinary, and the living presence, I have to wonder if I'm the only one who noticed Christ has an expression like a Cabbage Patch doll, and if that doesn't interfere with the divine transmission. The reason is, I believe, that the dark area above the corners of the mouth are from a residual mustache, perhaps even from a cheesy overpainting. However, because there's no visible hair, the darkness reads as a shadow, and there would only be a shadow if the lip were indented, and if it were indented, that would mean the adjacent flesh protruded, hence a classic cabbage patch mouth. The solution would be either to paint in a mustache, or get rid of the darkened area. To do neither creates this unfortunate expression. The problem with this sort of appeal to emotional experience as a way of validating the authenticity of art is that it's neither provable nor falsifiable. We don't even know if people are really having these experiences. There can be peer pressure, uh, the power of suggestion. People may be embarrassed to not have this kind of experience, like it'll make them look like they don't have a genuine appreciation of art. Christie's has a whole video that's just people's faces looking at the painting and having these extreme emotional responses. They don't even feel compelled to show the painting. This proves nothing. But it's a very sticky area if you're going to contest the validity. What do you say to this? You end up being a bit of an a-hole. You have to say, I don't believe you, or you're conjuring these emotions in yourself over a sham. The only way to use this as evidence would be to have a controlled experiment with a lineup of paintings, including the Salvatore Mundi, 
and people would look at them with electrodes on their heads so that we could analyze what their actual response is to the image. They would also have to not be familiar with it already. And if suddenly they have a spiritual experience only in front of the Salvatore Mundi, then we might be able to get something from that. But if we were to tell them that another painting of Christ, say this one, were Leonardo's last painting, and look at this, Christ has tears. And if we were to tell them that when people gaze upon this painting, they weep, I think a lot of people would have that experience. But that would not mean it's the last painting by Leonardo. This is a painting by Solario. So yeah, I am arguing for the power of suggestion here. Because for me, what would be the most important part of a painting of the savior of the world? Well, for me, it would be the eyes. It's going to be the face, but especially the eyes. And I can't look at these eyes without seeing a problem. So if I were to look at it in person, unless I'd really been hyped up and just bought into the whole thing, I would be stopped in my tracks by how awkward the eyes are looking in different directions and that they're different sizes. That would stop me. I would be thinking about this and wondering what the hell happened here? So if you are the Christ, yes, the great Jesus Christ, prove to me that you're no fool. Walk across my swimming pool. If you do that for me, then I'll let you go free. Come on, King of the Jews. The argument against the authenticity of the Salvatore Mundi as a genuine Leonardo are much easier to make than those supporting it. This is because the burden of proof is on those who want to say that this old painting is a genuine Leonardo, 100% executed by his own hand, and is valuable in the hundreds of millions of dollars. They will do backflips through flaming hoops to do so. They don't have bulletproof evidence. It's all circumstantial and anecdotal, people's feelings about it, the provenance. And you'll notice that when they discuss the connoisseurship, it's only of the hand and the curls. What they don't talk about is the majority of the real estate of the canvas, including the most important parts. They never mention the eyes or the nose or the mouth or the face or the head or even the hair, only the curls, not the rest of the hair. They don't mention the chest. I've covered many of the flaws with the face and the neck and the cut off thumb and the fingers at the bottom of the panel, but those are just some of the more obvious points. There's more to do with the composition and the cropping, but I'll let Jerry, the salty dog salt, address the composition. I think it's a real flim flam. I think that if you really look at this painting, Leonardo never painted anyone remotely like this, never anybody looking dead on, never anybody, never a surface this dull, inert, a mess. Never anything as simple as, I will stand like this. I will be a old school portrait. It is possible that like right there, right there, you know, right there, that Leonardo went and then went to the student. I think we've wished this Da Vinci into existence. I think it's fake art news. When I first saw the Salvatore Mundi, I had a similar reaction to what I later found out Jerry Saltz had to say which is that the composition was extremely static, and I was surprised that it was straight on. Usually artists kind of like to do a three-quarter view. That's the most fun for getting different angles and dramatic shadows. Well, Martin Kemp heard about Jerry Salt's criticisms of the painting, and he had a few choice words, not only for him, but for any of the critics. And uh, I know there's an art critic um, a name, a Jerry Saltz, he has a lot to say. The objections have come from people who don't understand Leonardo, don't understand Renaissance painting, don't understand the rules that, uh, that pertain, and got column inches by rubbishing something which, is, uh, uh, which went for £450 million. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a standard image. 
and it has to be frontal, that's how this image happens to work. Martin Kemp's first argument is unfortunately the old logical fallacy of the ad hominem attack. Rather than addressing the arguments of his critics, they must be wrong because they, one, know nothing about Leonardo, two, know nothing about Renaissance painting, and three, know nothing about the rules that pertain to how the Salvatore Mundi was traditionally depicted in the context of the time. And the first rule of that is that he must be depicted straight, head on. The Kempmeister also rebutted the Salty Dog in a written interview in Artnet News. This is from June 12th, 2019. Debunking this picture became fashionable. Leonardo da Vinci scholar Martin Kemp on what the public doesn't get about Salvator Mundi. The interviewer asks, how do you respond to some of the specific doubts or criticisms? For instance, art critic Jerry Salt says, the frontal view of Christ is out of step with Leonardo's style and represented a major stylistic step backward. Well, what Jerry Salt is saying is actually ill-informed. I think he doesn't understand the nature of Renaissance painting or Renaissance image making. The Salvatore Mundi is not a very common subject, but it's a standard subject. And to be a Salvatore Mundi, you have to do three things. First, Christ has to look at the spectator. His stare becomes unavoidable. In fact, that's commented on at the time, that the point of Salvatore Mundi is this ubiquitous view of God. The second aspect is that Christ should be blessing. This is part of the subject. And the third aspect is he should be holding a globe. And there you have the three rules. Kemp's argument is misleading here. It's as if he's countering a notion that the Salvatore Mundi shouldn't look at the viewer, doesn't hold up his right hand in the blessing, and doesn't hold the ball in his left. Why tell us these three facts when nobody's arguing about that? Jerry Saltz's argument is that the painting's too stiff, and he objects to the Salvatore Mundi facing dead forward, and he says Leonardo wouldn't do such a simple composition. Martin Kemp doesn't address those issues in this article. Only in the clip from the video that I shared does he assert that the Salvatore Mundi must face forward. And it's a, it's a, it's a standard image, and it has to be frontal, that's how this image happens to work. I took the liberty to assemble some images which substantiate Martin Kemp's position. Here we can see that the Salvatore Mundi was traditionally depicted fully facing dead forward. This example by Prevatali comes from 1519, which would be contemporaneous with or a little after Leonardo's, ostensibly Leonardo's, Salvatore Mundi. Here's a Gerard David Salvatore Mundi from 1500. Some of these depictions make me chuckle a little bit. A lot of them have the same kind of face, like this fellow. He's got a very big forehead that makes him look a bit like a kitten. It's endearing. Here's from the workshop of Hans Memling. And here's a Hans Memling from 1485. This Crivelli from 1470 also proves the point. However, he is looking not directly at us, but off to his right. The most convincing image to illustrate Kemp's point is this painting by van der Weyden of 1450. You'll notice that he can depict his subjects at angles very persuasively with a lot of skill, but nevertheless chose to paint Christ head on. And it's also the case that he painted Christ a bit less realistically and more stylistically. We might also notice the tradition of a very long nose. The debate doesn't end there, however. I also compiled a bunch of images in which Christ does not fully face forward. Here's one of my favorites from 1490 to 1500, and I just like this one because his face is so cruelly distorted. He is not facing forward, nor is he looking at us. He's looking down and to the left. This one is from 1590. We might be able to argue that later on in the century, people were able to take more liberties than Leonardo was able to at his time and disqualify this from countering Kemp's argument. This one by Albrecht Durer is contemporaneous or even earlier than Leonardo Salvatore Mundi, 
and he is not straight on. His head is obviously tilted at quite an angle, but we may argue he's a German Renaissance painter and not an Italian Renaissance painter. Perhaps that makes a difference. Another one from 1500 where he's not facing us nor looking at us. An illustrated manuscript from 1460. A painting after Memling where Christ's head is at a three-quarter angle. This one is by Titian. It's coming much later at 1570, and his head is also at a three-quarter angle. Here's a dynamic composition by Van Dyck from between 1617 and 1621. Again, it's later, so maybe things changed over time. And then there's this one. This is an Italian Renaissance painting by Domenico Gerlandau, who happened to study in Verrocchio's workshop where Leonardo also studied. Gerlandau is several years older than Leonardo, and this painting was painted before the ostensible Leonardo to the right. This Christ is not a full frontal view. You can see that his neck is tilting. His head is at nearly a 45 degree angle. He is also rotating his head on its axis to his right, and his eyes are rotating to the left. His shoulders are at an angle. This is a much more dynamic composition. We might also note that it sold at Christie's, mind you, for just over $2 million after this Salvator Mundi was sold, and for a tiny fraction of the cost when it is a vastly superior painting, much more interesting and dynamic, much more persuasive. If you look at this one, you can see how flat it is, the shoulders coming straight across, everything is just straight up and down. Because this Jurlan Dao Salvator Mundi predates the ostensible Leonardo version, and is also a Renaissance painting from Italy, even from Florence. This proves Martin Kemp flat out wrong. If Girlandau could do it before Leonardo, Leonardo could do it if he wanted to. If Leonardo painted the Salvator Mundi straight on, which is possible, he did so because he elected to do so, not because it was the standard way to do it and he had no choice. Uh no, there are, there are a number of, a number of critics got uh, good column inches by saying very silly things. Oh, how's that for a topper? <laughs> Another problem for the supporters of an autograph Leonardo is that the painting in question is the most closely cropped version of the Salvatore Mundi. Here is the Modestini version with empty space all around it. Now that empty space is filled with the additional real estate present in the Ganet version. If the Modestini version is the original, why does the Ganet painting have more information? One might wonder if the Modestini Salvatore Mundi had been physically cropped at some point, or if a frame had damaged the underlying paint, and if the paint had been stripped away when the frame was removed. Modestini addresses the issue on her own website. There is a reserve of unpainted wood on three sides of the painting with a slight barb. This demonstrates that the composition has not been cut down. The composition is closely cropped, both the blessing hand and the crystal orb were painted right up to the edges of the panel. This is a problem because the Christ figure looks crammed into the picture plane. Why would Leonardo spend years painting over an obviously awkward and claustrophobic composition? Further, cropped versions of paintings are suspected of being copies. As Michael Daly pointed out in a 2017 edition of Artwatch UK, Cropped digits and limbs are so commonly encountered in copies as to constitute attribution alarm bells. They are found in works given to Caravaggio, Rubens, and Leonardo. Just as a thumb on Christ's left hand in the New York Salvatore Mundi is inexplicably cropped and nowhere addressed, so are Samson's toes in the National Gallery's Rubens, Samson, and Deliah, etc. It is being claimed that the New York Salvatore Mundi is the prototype original for all other versions when it is in fact the only version to carry a cropped thumb. 
Did every other artist ignore or correct a mismanaged painted prototype composition by Leonardo? Daly shared three images for comparison. On the far right is the Modestini Salvatore Mundi with the truncated thumb. In the center is the Gian Pietrino version with room to spare to the right of the thumb. And on the left is the Ganet with extra space both to the right of the thumb and beneath the knuckles. If we look at the six Salvatore Mundi paintings I previously assembled, there are more causes for concern. If the other five paintings are all just copies after the Modestini version, why don't any of them match it or each other? At the same time that we're expected to accept the instance of Pentimento in the second thumb as strong evidence of Leonardo's hand, because a copyist wouldn't make any changes, all the other versions include significant departures from the supposed original. Thus, artists could change Christ's clothes, add material around the edges, alter his left hand position, the size of the ball, take away his beard and mustache, and invent content all around the periphery, but they didn't have the temerity to change the position of one digit on his right hand midway through making the painting. The logic just seems a little fuzzy there to me. The most consistent element between all but the top right version is the right hand, including the sleeve bunching just below the wrist and its specific folds. It is also significantly about the strongest section of all the respective paintings, including and especially the Modestini version, at least in its current incarnation. All of this suggests the possibility that there was no original painting, but that each version is based on sketches the most refined of which was a drawing of the right hand. According to Michael Daly, within the Leonardo literature, there is no documentary record of the artist ever having been involved in such a painting project. The first record of a work of this subject by the attributed hand of Leonardo occurs only in the 17th century in England. As far as I'm aware, nobody has explained away why the would-be original composition is overly cropped. There's another small issue to do with the wooden panel, namely that it was of inferior quality from Modestini's site. There is a large knot in the lower part along the central axis where a branch emerged from the tree. The flawed substandard quality of the walnut panel cannot be overemphasized. It is essentially a discard and Leonardo cannot have failed to recognize this. Although he often experimented with materials to achieve the painterly effects he desired, and sometimes this went drastically wrong, this is different from adopting shoddy materials for a project in which he was to lavish so much time and care over a period of many years. If Leonardo couldn't have missed the flaws in the panel, and he knew he would devote years of lavish care to painting over it, why then did he use it? Modestini gave a surprising answer in the 2011 BBC documentary Da Vinci, The Lost Treasure. That is the crack in the wood. It just missed his face. I imagine it had gone through the middle. Yeah, miraculous. Just missed the face. Yeah. You see, it is all it came from this knot. Oh, a knot in the wood. The knot, there was a oh, knot I in the see. wood. The wood had this defect. Leonardo was never very careful about his um, wooden supports. Given how meticulous he was about everything else, that's quite yes. surprising. It's it? very surprising. Apparently, he didn't care. Curiously, the Kempmeister has a very different explanation. Now, I wonder why he chose a panel that had a knot in it, which later caused the crack. Yeah. And luckily, around the face, it didn't go through the face. It's a, it's a walnut panel, and he liked walnut panels for these smaller scale pictures. It's a, it's obviously he felt it was a good surface to paint on and I think he he obviously wouldn't have been aware that the it was going to warp and, and crack in that way. Neither his contention that Leonardo would have been blissfully unaware of the panel's conspicuous flaws nor Diane's assertion that he would absolutely but wouldn't give a hoot is satisfyingly convincing. It still seems a very weird and suspect choice.
most dangerous argument against the attribution of the Salvatore Mundi as an autograph Leonardo is that someone else painted it entirely, most likely one of his students or followers. The less potent variety of this challenge, and conversely the much more difficult to counter, is that an apprentice painted the majority of the canvas. In this scenario, the master just made select adjustments, perhaps only to demonstrate technique. One of the prime candidates for having made the painting is Leonardo's student, Giovanni Antonio Boltraffio. There is a 2019 article in The Guardian titled, Leonardo da Vinci expert declines to back Salvatore Mundi as his painting. Apparently, one of the experts who Christie's listed as attributing the painting to Leonardo objected to that claim. Dr. Carmen Bombach, who is a curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, told The Guardian, That is not representative of my opinion. In her forthcoming four-volume study of the polymath, a vast project spanning more than one million words and 1,500 images, Bombach attributes most of the picture to Leonardo's assistant, Giovanni Antonio Boltraffio, with only small retouchings by the master himself. Our next contestant is Leonardo's studio assistant, Bernardino Luini. Leonardo scholar, Matthew Landris is the primary advocate for Luini. In a 2018 Guardian article, Leonardo Scholar challenges attribution of $450 million painting, Landris is quoted as saying, This is a Luini painting. By looking at the various versions of Leonardo's students' works, one can see that Luini paints just like that work you see in the Salvatore Mundi. He said between 5 and 20% of the painting was by Leonardo, and that Luini was the primary painter. Landris said, I can prove that Luini painted most of that painting. A comparison of Luini's paintings with the Salvatore Mundi will be sufficient evidence. Describing Luini as one of Leonardo's two most talented studio assistants, the other being Giovanni Antonio Boltraffio, he has compared Luini's Christ Among the Doctors in the National Gallery with the Salvatore Mundi. The evidence has led him to conclude that Luini was the only reasonable candidate for much of the authorship. He added, by traditional standards, we can call it a Leonardo studio painting. Earlier we addressed the question of which version of the Salvatore Mundi was the best, in which case the original from which all the others were copied, and presuming that the original must have been done by Leonardo himself. Troubles are over. <laughs> Look what I found tucked away in my files. <laughs> what is it? Plans for a condominium in Transylvania? <laughs> no, it's your original blueprint. <laughs> the original? This is a separate question, which is, could anyone else have painted our version of the Salvatore Mundi? For this exercise, we need to look at this version of the Salvatore Mundi, which is the cleaned version before there was any retouching. Let's start off with Boltraffio, the portrait of a boy as Saint Sebastian, and the hand is tucked into his clothes, so we can't really judge how well he does hands there. He does that again with this portrait, which makes me wonder a little if he's uncomfortable doing hands. When he does do them in this virgin and child, they seem competent, but if we look at this hand, it doesn't seem to have the same underlying anatomy or complex shading as our version of the Salvatore Mundi. This version of the virgin and child is his better one. If you look at this hand, the shape is much more convincing and varied. You can even see the cuticles, that one seems quite exaggerated. Wrinkles on the knuckles, there seems to be some veins underneath. It's a much better shape, but it's not the same degree of shading. This hand, however, shows an ability to render the nails at various angles, and I get more of the same sense of the hand. When it comes to the fabric, there's not enough left in our version to really tell, but 
he seems able to do fabric as well. We can see some intricate fabric here. This fabric here is about of the same level as the sleeve. When it comes to the hair, this one is the best example. And this hair is quite complex. It's coming down here and then there's another angle thrown in. There are individual hairs going in opposite directions to the main curls here. So we do have some variation within the underlying structure. It's not the same curls, but it does suggest he might be capable of doing it. In this version of the Madonna and Child, the baby's curls are also fairly sophisticated, suggesting he could, in fact, do those curls. And this face of the Madonna is also quite reminiscent of the face in the Salvatore Mundi. She also has a very similar face. So I would say Boltrafio is a definite possibility. Boltrafio was Carmen Bombach's pick for who completed the Salvador Mundi, at least most of it. Matthew Landris's pick, on the other hand, is Bernardino Luini. This is the painting of Christ among the doctors that he specifically mentions. Have a look yourself and see if you think it's the same caliber of craftsmanship as we can see in our version of the Salvatore Mundi. The first thing you may notice is that Christ's head is quite similar. The long nose, this shape of the mouth, the eyes, and there's something amusing here, which is that this left eye is larger than the right eye, and the right eye is higher up just like in our Salvatore Mundi. Every artist has their strengths and weaknesses, and artists can be identified by their weaknesses as well as their strengths. This is one of Luini's weaknesses. Here we can see it again. The left eye is too big, the right eye is smaller and higher up. A bit of that is going on here, but because <laughs> I'm just laughing because I had to remind myself of the title. Is this Christ or is this Magdalene or Madonna? Sometimes they're a bit androgynous. I mean, okay, this is Christ. <laughs> uh, his eyes. <laughs> uh, because his head is at an angle, you can't really tell if it has that same problem. But this Saint Catherine uh, has the same bigger left eye and the right eye smaller and up. Here we go again in this painting where this eye is larger. Here's a cleaned up version of this painting and let's uh, use this time to address how well Luini can or can't paint clothing. Well, it's quite spectacular here. The way he does pattern going over folds is exceptional. I'd say it's even better than I see in our version of the Salvatore Mundi. However, on the same painting, you can see this rather rubbery hand. And this is another weakness of Luini. His hands are peculiar. Look at this hand of Christ, not Magdalene or Mary or St. Catherine. The pinky and this second finger are almost the same size, and that's quite a meaty pinky. These folds are the same as on the blessing hand of the Salvatore Mundi, though. Interestingly enough, it is Christ giving a blessing. If you look at these hands here, they're particularly telling. The knuckles are just suggestions of mounds. The veins are all the same color, and it looks like Luini just used lines to suggest them. They're flat lines. The shading is in contradiction with the other hand. Here we see the underside of the finger gets the shade, where here it's the right side. It's as if he just thought left of finger gets light, right of finger gets shade. A left of finger gets light, right of finger gets shade but not considering what angle the fingers are at in relation to the light, which is the upper left. Really not sure about this shading. Or this shape of this thumb, or these two fingers. In any case, the hands look like painted hands, 
rather than paintings of hands, if that makes sense. Compare again to the ostensible Leonardo, ignoring the thumb by the restorer, where there's much more naturalism. And notice that the lighting, it starts off medium here, gets brighter, and then there's a gradation to the darkness, where in this Luini, it only goes from light to dark. This woman is another good example, portrait of a lady. He can do fabric very well. He must have studied that. Maybe he was the guy in the workshop that took care of doing the fabric. And who knows, maybe more than one student worked on the painting. But this is very interesting and suggestive of the real material. His collar's done really well. But look at these hands. This one, yikes, something is going wrong here. Is this lobster woman? These fingers, they're just not making sense. Or, nor is this thumb. It's like he didn't use a model at all and he just winged it. I'll just share this one that I quite like by Luini. This may be my favorite one. Her eyes aren't as weird. She's very stylized. The hand is done a little better. It's a nice, quiet painting of a woman. And I like the leaves and the hair. Very nice painting. In conclusion, I'm going to say that while Luini could definitely have painted the fabric, I don't think he could have done the hands. Oh, but perhaps the most important thing, odd as it is, is that he may be uniquely qualified to have rendered the mismatched wonky eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, our third candidate, well, only a candidate in my own mind, I don't know of anyone else who has mentioned him in connection with the Salvatore Mundi as a possible author. Here he is anyways, Andrea Solario. If you don't know who he is, and why would you? He's also known as Andrea Solari. The important thing you need to know is he was an Italian Renaissance painter of the Milanese school, living from 1460 to 1524. Well, he was alive at the time, just the right age, and he was one of the most important followers of Leonardo da Vinci. So let's have a look at Solario, my personal favorite here. I shared this image before, and also this one, just to show that it's possible that someone could do elaborate curls besides Leonardo. Let's address the hands. Well, here's a good hand in this Solario, and you can see veins, and he didn't just use one color to draw a line He's created ridges. You could touch the vein and obstruct the blood flow if you so desire. There's ligaments in the hand. Here's a, a bone of the wrist. And look at this treatment of the elbow and the musculature here. A little Leonardo-esque in that there's no lines. It's all done with shading to achieve these subtle bulges. In this example of Christ at the Column, he's done a very good job of creating the musculature and the bones and the structure of the torso here. That's quite a good sternum for what it's worth. And he's created these same indentations on both shoulders at a different perspective, a little different lighting to give the same impression. That takes some skill. Let's look at this one. Look at this hand. You get the wrinkling and buckling of the flesh here. The differently shaped knuckles. Here's an indentation. Look at these muscles here, very subtle. Here, bones and ligaments. You have reflected light on the inside of this finger. Not just going light to dark, but reflected light. Also here on the bottom of the forearm. This one too, it's quite good. Here, just for fun, I superimposed this face on the Salvatore Mundi, and it's probably merely coincidence, but it fits really quite nicely. But I would say that Solario could paint a face. His face that he painted here is a lot better painted than this one. So is Solario our candidate? Well, no, he's not. Because this whole time I've been talking about which apprentice or follower or student is good enough to have painted the best parts of the Salvatore Mundi. 
everyone seems to agree from Jerry Saltz to Martin Kemp, Bombeck, Landris, that the best parts of the painting here and here were painted by Leonardo or possibly painted by Leonardo. It's the rest we're not sure. Why is it not as good? There are different explanations. Martin Kemp says, oh, it's out of focus because he's putting the focal point on the hand and that's so experimental and new. Maybe, but even if the face was out of focus, it would be of the same caliber of skill. So essentially, we're trying to find out not who's good enough to have done the best parts, but who's bad enough to have botched the rest. And if that's what we're looking for, someone who might have made some conspicuous errors, perhaps our man is Luini. But there's another issue, which is if we're trying to determine who painted the parts that are not as realized, those are, coincidentally or not, also the areas that are most damaged. How can we tell who painted the damaged parts? Are we going to look at this shoulder and say, oh, I knew who paints fabric like that. Nobody paints fabric like that. Are we going to look at this eye and say, ah, I know exactly who paints eyes like that. Nobody paints eyes like that. It's all scratched up. The paint's missing. It's been overpainted. Look at this. Oh, yes, I know who does jewels like this. I know who paints a pinky like that. I know who paints fingers like this. I know who paints an orb like this. You can't see the orb. So from my perspective, when it comes to who might have painted all but the finest details, I don't know how anyone can tell. Now, remember what I taught you. <laughs> Tell you what, dang old dumb diddly, talk about you gon' psychedelic sci-fi Mona Lisa robot people no living in what you gonna do about Leonardo. I need to clarify that when I say I'm doing a cleaning stage for digital editing, it means something a little different. For the physical painting, this is already the cleaned stage, meaning that previous restorations and retouching as well as dramatic overpaintings have been removed to reveal as much of the original painting as possible. But if you were doing photo editing, cleaning means to remove the dusts and scratches and tears and other damage to a photo. It's a little different. So I am cleaning the cleaned state. Now, to do this requires really only photo editing skills. You don't need to be able to draw or paint, but you do for the next stage, which is to try and recreate what the painting may have looked more like before it was damaged. However, because this is a painting, it does help to be able to analyze the underlying structure and think about it that way and think about it like an artist. So it does help to be an artist. And one of the first things I did was consider the symmetry of the face. I would assume that the original artist would make the face roughly symmetrical. Not 100% symmetrical because it needs to have some character and you don't want it to look robotic. But it wouldn't be wildly off as it appears to be in the final restored version with these eyes askew and all that I've pointed out enough times already. So the first thing I wanted to do was try and find the center line of the face. And I discovered something very interesting and to my surprise, as uneven as the eyes appear, especially in this version, the eyelids are actually parallel, both at the bottom here and the top here. And the same could be said for a bottom lid. Now this right here is some sort of abrasion, this lightning. This is not part of the eyelid. The eyebrows also meet. Next, I wanted to see about the distance between them using this center line. First, how about the nose placement? Okay, the sides of the nose roughly line up. Pupil placement, pretty good. Outer eye placement, okay, not bad. And let's look at the inner eye placement. 
this all seems to line up pretty well. However, that is not the case with the restored version. Here, this eyelid is above that one, and this eyelid is above that one, and this eyelid is clearly below that one. This is about how you read the information on this original cleaned painting. I don't know how the restorer did it, but I would start with the assumption that they are parallel, and to the degree of interpretation one does, which should be minimal, I would tend to favor the direction of symmetry. So here, you can see the restorer interpreted a line to make this upper eyelid above this one. I'll show you the next thing I did, which was to try to establish the symmetry by using Photoshop's symmetrized option. It allows you to draw on one side and it will draw on the other. And so I picked the most clear aspects on either side and produced this kind of rough outline. And again, all the parts roughly line up quite nicely. So I put the upper eyelid here, which coordinates with the horizontal parallel lines. And you can see how different this is from where the restorer ended up making the line. And in effect, she has moved this eye up from where it was in the clean state. You can also see she has moved this eye out further to the left. It was completely inadvertent, but it is the end result. Now, I discovered something else even more disturbing, I might say, and that has to do with the nose. When I created the symmetrical face, we can see how it matches over the cleaned version rather nicely. Down here, you just have a shadow because it's lit from the upper left, as you can clearly see here. But when we put my symmetrical outline over the restored version, we see a big surprise, which is this tip of the nose coming way out to the left and down. And that gives it that strange, bulbous, slightly grotesque shape. The reason there are two different photo versions of the restored version is partly that one comes later. This is the most recent one, and you can see some conspicuous differences on the fabric of this shoulder. Most of it, however, is the same in regards to the drawing and painting, and the color is different probably just because of how the painting was photographed. This one has more color in it, but I would say that neither has the color of the original. If you look at the skin tones here, the modeling right here, let's say, it's almost photographic in its subtlety, but that is not at all the case here or here. The restorer makes a very persuasive argument that the reason it's so hard to photograph the Salvatore Mundi is because of the surface. It's warped, there's built up areas, there's scraped away areas, chips, missing parts. It's a very uneven surface. While this may seem to explain why this version of the painting can't be photographed very well, somehow this version could be photographed. And there's a little bit of a funny thing where people say that the painting is so mystical and uh, ineffable, divine, and uncanny that the camera just can't capture it. Well, if that's the case, the camera could capture Leonardo's work, but the camera couldn't capture the restorer's work. I'd like to mention some other curious differences between the cleaned version and the final version. The most conspicuous is the difference between these cross bands and the final ones, and that is that the fabric comes in here and covers this band where they intersect. Another issue I find is the edge of the hair. All around the head, it appears as if it was cut out, kind of like a paper cutout in both versions, mind you, so that the background is a solid black and the whole figure of Christ appears as a paper cutout glued to the background. If we look at this painting by Luini, you can see how he fades the hair into the background. 
It's part of the process of modeling. The shoulder gets darker and merges into the background. His hand gets darker and models around the form so that the whole form subtly merges into the background. You can see the same thing here. This is Leonardo's student. We have the same phenomenon here. So the decision to clearly demarcate the head from the background with a straight line like a cutout seems really quite bizarre to me and adds to an overall effect of a lack of true modeling. This is also strongly apparent in this shoulder. The shoulder, because of the way it's lit, is one of the most forwardly protruding parts of the canvas. Meanwhile, Christ's right shoulder, which is more directly in the light, which is coming from the left, is hidden, obscured in darkness. Nevertheless, this shoulder, further from the light, with both the hair and the head as possible impediments to the light reaching it, is fully illuminated. This is not as much the case at all in this cleaned version, and this may be dramatically overcleaned. Magnification 3 on the screen. Magnification factor 3, sir. Exactly what are we looking for, Mr. Spock? I would assume that. And here, alas, is my clean stage. The motivation behind making this at all was mere curiosity to see what the painting would look like without all the damage. But before extensive restoration significantly altered its overall appearance, no such image existed prior to my taking the trouble to produce it. It is intended to give a general sense of what the painting might have looked like in its original state, but does not go beyond, at this point, merely camouflaging the most egregious of cracks, covering the white glue used to hold the two halves of the panel together, and masking heavily scraped off areas of paint. Some areas I've just more or less filled with a median color. Most of the hair on Christ's right side of the face is missing, you can't fix that without adding new information that's not there, and this requires using some drawing and painting skills. I'll move on to that stage later. Notice that the restorer created hair to fill this void, and incidentally, without employing any discernible ability at drawing or painting whatsoever. It is quite probably not within the restorer's jurisdiction to make changes of a drawing or painterly nature. However, the restorer still did something. I think it is remarkably apparent that the resulting amorphous tendrils do not represent Leonardo's technique or any technique. Rather, the hair is an attempt to, hopefully inconspicuously, budge content into an area where none was left. You may have noticed that my cleaned up state doesn't have the chipmunk cheeks that Michael Daly mentioned, or the cabbage patch doll mouth. The nose isn't squashed to the left, it isn't floppy, nor is the tip afflicted with the beginnings of an unfortunately placed tumor. Those additions evolved unintentionally as a process of the restorer's retouching. They do not reflect the vision or draftsmanship of the original artist, be it Leonardo, his protégés, or any combination thereof. Malfunction, Mr. Spock? That said, I also lost some of the Christ figure's personality, particularly along the right side of his face. It's a very subtle game to make adjustments to his visage without changing his demeanor. Unlike the Christ Blessing painting by Luini that I shared previously, this Christ is decidedly masculine. His features are a bit chiseled, and I detect a tinge of severity. This savior is no wuss. He seems to possess the wherewithal to drive the money changers out of the temple. In fact, this stronger depiction of the savior is one of the primary reasons I suspect this painting really could be by the master himself. Nobody else depicted him in this manner. And 
is it just me or was something or everything of that inherent power lost in the full restoration? For my eye, those are two very different people. In defense of the restorer, there is a curious effect where the damage in some ways enhances or accentuates the dramatic presence of the savior. The scraped away paint on the left of the top of his head creates a golden halo effect, like on medieval paintings. Even the damage to the right eye creates an illusion of some inner illumination, fueling a glowing eye. And how do you recreate missing passages in a master's painting? If his own students in his own workshop couldn't do it, under his direct instruction, nobody really can, including yours truly, obviously. You'd have to be as great of an artist as Leonardo himself, at least technically, just to pull off the technique. But it is impossible that anyone else could ever render an image which is a manifestation of Leonardo's inner being. In some ways, all art is a self-portrait because it is the way the artist chooses to present himself to the world. In such a case, you can never paint someone else's self-portrait, just as you could never write their own autobiography, except as an imaginative exercise. My cleaned up, photo edited variation of the Salvatore Mundi is moving in the right direction and has shed the extraneous additions unwittingly forged by the restorer. But it still has a very long and arduous journey ahead of it. Just one of the many obstacles I'll need to tackle is extensively creating convincing hair. In its present state overall, there remain some outstanding problems with the painting. For one, the face has the look about it of a cigar store wooden Indian. It's a cigar store Indian! This is largely due to the damaged and thus unfinished eyes, with the absence of a full pupil in his right eye serving to award him a wooden cataract. The nose is always going to be too long to be realistic, but that was an idealized proportion of the period and exceedingly common in Renaissance paintings. The eyes are still wonky, and due to the damaged, skewed, and misleading vestiges of modeling, there is the optical illusion that Christ's right eye is much higher than the left. And while I've gotten rid of the cabbage patch doll mouth, the mouth is still awkward and uneven. His left arm shoots straight down, merely in order to fit it into the picture plane at all. His shoulder comes to a sharp right angle that would be amateurish on a painting of a robot. I could do nothing for the left hand because so precious little of it remains. I'll need to recreate it almost entirely. The orb is a circle, but it is not a convincing sphere. It's not reflecting any light, while well, even the hand is. The savior of the world still has no neck, collarbone, or throat. And of course, the problem with the cut-off thumb and the overall cramped composition remains. Such issues again call into question the authenticity of the painting. Nevertheless, I am proceeding with a goodly portion of willing suspension of disbelief, in which case imagining the painting really is by Leonardo and trying to resurrect it as such. There's an episode of I Love Lucy from 1957 called Building a Barbecue that serves as an excellent analogy. Fred and Ricky build a backyard barbecue, but after it's completed, Lucy realizes her wedding ring is missing and assumes she lost it while mixing cement. She and Ethel completely dismantle the barbecue in an attempt to find the ring, fail to do so, and then hastily reassemble the barbecue. 
We can say that the resulting catastrophe is 100% the craftsmanship of Fred and Ricky, based on forensic analysis and circumstantial evidence. The bricks come from the hardware store where they had previously bought supplies. There's a sketch on a napkin by Ricky of the rough dimensions. The cement hardened during the period they lived at the residence. Several bricks in the back corner were very competently stacked. The barbecue was located in a practical spot where only the two men would have built it. Fred's thumbprint, or at least a man's thumbprint, is preserved in a bit of cement, indicating his specific method of using his fingers to wipe away excess cement. As long as we don't address what's not being said, the barbecue is an autograph Fred and Ricky creation. There are a lot of people that will insist that the Salvatore Mundi, as it appears today, accurately represents Leonardo's original intent and is virtually indistinguishable from the image that he painted 500 years ago. That is the conclusion they have a vested interest in maintaining by any and all means necessary. To justify the wonky eyes, they may argue that the painting is in the tradition of the Christ Pantocrator, which means almighty or all-powerful. In the oldest known icon of the Christ, Pantocrator, some people theorize that the two sides of his face are asymmetrical as a deliberate device intended to convey Christ's dual nature, one side the divine, the other the human. This doesn't explain what looks like a case of severe swelling, perhaps advanced goiter on the right side of his neck, or that the perspective used on the Bible makes it look more like an accordion than a book. What does explain all of these painterly anomalies rather handily are just the typical sorts of errors in representation we see in much older paintings, this one from the 6th or 7th century. Others will say that it was a commissioned portrait, and the person the Salvatore Mundi is modeled on actually happened to look just like that. In which case, the painting is a testament to Leonardo's unflinching realism. But there's a much simpler explanation, though I gather it's not one they want to entertain. The original face was dramatically obscured and disfigured by damage, restorations, and overpaintings, and then finally further distorted through the most recent bout of retouching. Just how damaged was or is this painting? There's what we can see with the naked eye in the photo of the clean state of the painting, which is already quite a lot. But there's more behind the surface image. At first, I thought those white streaks crossing the painting were exposed areas of the underlying white paint, or primer. It's much worse than that. Those streaks are white glue holding together pieces of the panel itself. The panel had at some point in its history splintered into several pieces, and it was then glued back into place on an underlying piece of wood. A contemporary panel expert had to separate out the pieces again because, quote, no attention had been paid to aligning the pieces correctly. Can you guess what this is? In this photo, we see the backside of the largest hunk of the panel, replete with extensive worm tunneling. In this picture, you can see the physical cracks in the panel, minus the white glue. And in this image, the pieces of the panel are being set back together by the panel expert. While these fractures probably represent the greatest damages to the painting, they are only the most glaring instances of a process of overall deterioration. The restorer details further damages to the paint. A series of events associated with heavy-handed attempts to correct the alignment of the two halves of the painting resulted in severe damage to the curls on the proper right side of the head and adjoining passages of the flesh tones of the cheek. Other losses probably associated with worm tunneling are present in the forehead, the end of the nose, and passages of the proper left eye and cheek. These losses are clearly visible in the infrared scan. The eyes, particularly the proper right eye, are abraded. 
The area of the chin, neck, and breast were harshly cleaned with strong solvents, resulting in abrasion of the original paint layers. The thinly painted upper part of the orb, the upper part of the palm, and the fingers have also suffered from abrasion due to harsh cleaning. Much of the original background was scraped off, including the upper part of the hair. The knot itself, which coincides with the center of the stole with the kabucha, kabucha jewels, fragmented into five pieces of wood. These were reattached to the two main sections of the panel, but little of the original design survived. The next big question and piece of the puzzle is, how much of the damage could possibly be fixed at all, and how accurately? What percentage of the final image would remain damaged, or only minimally patched? And how much would need to be fudged or interpreted? How much of the original Leonardo painting needs to remain intact to call the painting 100% an autograph Leonardo creation? Can a painting this damaged be restored to a state that does the original artist justice? The restorer humbly and frankly addresses this very question in the opening paragraph of the condition section of her website. The restoration of a badly damaged painting, particularly one by a supreme artist, can never be satisfactory. If one possesses intelligence and humility, essential traits of any decent restorer, you always hold in balance the sense of the futility of your efforts and the necessity and determination to succeed as best you can to render the image legible while trying not to pollute the traces of the great mind that produced it. One is required to juxtapose with original whatever feeble imitation can be mustered. It is an impossible task and failure is inevitable. Modestini openly concedes that her restoration is a feeble imitation and an inevitable failure, as it would be were anyone else tasked with such an impossible project. Was this false modesty? Did she end up exceeding her expectations and not fail? Probably not, since she most likely wrote this preface long after most of the restoration was complete. Or did it not matter if she failed, as long as the results were passably convincing to most audiences, everyone else could be bullied into agreeing, or to persuade a single buyer? What kind of difficulties did she encounter with this particularly daunting project? One misplaced dot of paint from a treble zero brush, and it would shift the gaze so that the eyes appeared either crossed or blind. After many attempts over a period of several months, I reached a reasonably satisfactory result by doing as little as possible. Note here that the best that was achieved was a reasonably satisfactory result. If one misplaced dot of paint from a tiny brush could make the eyes crossed or blind, what can multiple, thicker cracks, abrasions, and worn away paint do to skew the original character of the eyes? She has also been quoted as saying, Since both eyes have been abraded, the left one to a greater degree than the right, the ambiguity between abrasion and highlight made the restoration extremely difficult, and I redid it numerous times. As little as possible was done to the left eye. No attempt was made, for example, to emphasize the pupil, which is reasonably well preserved in the right eye carefully following the remnants of the original, which contain a line drawing to place the lower lid, resulted in eyes of slightly different size. The left is smaller than the right. Imposing a more logical or definite shape caused the eyes to completely change character. Here, she was unable to make significant changes to improve the eyes because it was too dangerous to do so and would alter the character of the Salvatore Mundi. That's because any such change would make the eyes look more deliberate and hence easier to interpret. It's only the vagueness of being abraded that saves the eyes from being utterly insipid. What else needs to be said here is that the character in question is not the originally envisioned or depicted character, but the disfigured one that is the result of extensive damage and deterioration. She resorted to making the heavily compromised eyes the template from which she could not deviate. The eyes are thus not restored, but merely preserved, with some cosmetic camouflaging to blend into the rest of the face. 
We've established that the painting was in a critically deteriorated condition, and that restoration on such a compromised work was a recipe for failure. The restorer has further admitted to doing the minimum alteration to the heavily abraded eyes, with only reasonably satisfactory results, in which case areas which were damaged to a greater extent were left maximally in that same condition. But what portion of the overall image is so compromised? To answer that question, we can bring back the expert whom Christie's hired to promote the painting, our dear old friend, the Kempmeister. Um, this talk about only 20% or so of, of this painting is original. Well, first of all, the 20% is absolutely 100% 100, 100 misleading. Okay. Uh, if you say how much survives of the Leonardo surface in its absolutely pristine condition, then you might get down to that kind of level. But if you look at the picture and it was stripped down and you, you're back to original paint, uh, it's, it's quite high. I, I wouldn't wish to quantify it very precisely, but I would say about 80% of the panel is covered in paint that Leonardo put on. Wow. Some of that is under painting or lower layers. Some places of the top layers hasn't survived, so it's quite, a, it's quite complicated. Kemp goes on to claim that many old paintings in museums have a comparable ratio of original paint relative to restored paint. However, it's not just a question of what the ratio is. It matters which 20% was painted by a contemporary restorer. A background? Clothing? A dog? Or a face? And how persuasive the result is. It's also worth pointing out that his 80% Leonardo, 20% restorer figure includes underlying paint for Leonardo, paint which is largely invisible to the naked eye. There's a question of paint by mass and paint by visibility. The more important question is how much of the visible image on the surface of the painting is the master's creation and what portion the restorer's feeble imitation to use Monastini's own characterization. To help us determine that, we need to understand a bit more about the authentication of the painting. Let's return to our pal, Bill Heydrich. This is the evidence on which we base the attribution to Leonardo. This is what those scholars gathered together by Nicholas Penny at the National Gallery in London. This is what they looked at. The painting we see today looks fairly finished question is why is that are we is it is it a distortion of what Leonardo did when in fact this is pretty much what is original there are a couple very important facts tucked into this clip first the scholars who are credited with attributing the painting to Leonardo did so based on the cleaned state of the painting this signifies that any deviation from or distortion of that clean state obviously and absolutely cannot be attributable to Leonardo's hand. The second fact is that the current incarnation of the painting appears to be finished and complete. There is the peculiar impression this gives, which nobody has mentioned to my knowledge, that damaged areas which the restorer could not fix and or accentuated are misinterpreted as the original intent and design of Leonardo himself. If the painting is fully finished and the eyes are on the razor's edge between being crossed or blind, people feel compelled to justify Leonardo's decision to render them that way. In reality, the eyes remain highly abraded, according to the restorer herself, because she couldn't fix them, but they have a bit of makeup judiciously applied. The same goes for the nose, the mouth, cheeks, jaws, much of the hair, the relation between the hair and the background, the clothes, the orb, and the majority of the left hand. It is imperative to understand that nobody has attributed the finished painting, the full image itself as a singular coherent vision and work of art, to Leonardo da Vinci, one of his followers or protégés, or to anyone else for that matter.
But let's dig further. How much of the clean state was attributable to Leonardo's own hand, and which parts? I found an answer to that in a 2019 article in The Art Newspaper, which addresses the concerns raised by Ben Lewis in his book The Last Leonardo, also published in 2019. Lewis reports that five leading Leonardo scholars were shown the painting in May 2008. In his book, he records the result. The final score from the National Gallery meeting seems to have been two yeses, one no, and two no comments. There was some common ground between those present, to be sure. They agreed that Leonardo had added his brush to parts of the picture, notably the orb and its foreshortened hand, the golden embroidery, and above all, the blessing hand. And the majority agreed that the face had been so badly damaged that they could no longer tell who had painted it. What caught my attention here is that the experts only overwhelmingly agreed on one thing, that they couldn't tell who painted the face. And so it is only the cleaned version of the painting that is attributable to Leonardo, only portions of it, and definitely not the face or the eyes. But it's worse than that, because the restorer added her own mistakes, interpretations, and distortions which I have already addressed. But that is not just my subjective opinion, thank you. A 2018 article in The Guardian by art critic Jonathan Jones contains a very revealing quote by none other than Martin Kemp and concerning the two thumbs of the right blessing hand. Both thumbs says Kemp of the painting's raw state, are rather better than the one painted by Diane. This little offhand snippet is a frank admission that a part of the painting is unequivocally not painted by Leonardo and is patently inferior to his own workmanship. I think the Kemp Meister might also admit to the same shortcomings in the curls Modestini invented on the right side of Christ's face or her rendering of the tip of the nose. In my opinion, those shortcomings in the draftsmanship and modeling department apply to most of the panel, and apparently Jonathan Jones shares that opinion. In the article, he wrote about the photo of the cleaned or raw state. In fact, the photo was something of a bombshell, a glimpse of a painting that looks dramatically different from the restored version. Time had left Christ partly bald with impaired eyes, yet the face was truly beautiful, smooth and harmonious but anatomically precise. It is completely different in tone and feeling from the smoky, ambiguous appearance of the painting today, after its full treatment by the respected restorer Diane Dwyer Modestini. Jones also quotes Martin Clayton, curator of Leonardo's drawings at the Royal Library in Windsor Castle, as saying, Photographs seem to show that, before it was touched up, it was all Leonardo. They show the painting mid-restoration, and it looks as if the subsequent retouching has obscured the quality of the face. And there's a curious interpretation of reality in which, if Diane Modestini retouched those areas rather extensively, out of necessity, mind you, the painting can still be 100% by the hand of Leonardo. However, if Bull Traffi or Luini had painted those same portions in Leonardo's own workshop 500 years ago, the painting would not be considered an autograph Leonardo, but a Leonardo studio painting, nor would it be worth more than a few million dollars tops. None of this seems to make sense on the surface, but that's because we're missing the bigger picture when it comes to how the painting is packaged for public consumption. There's a clue to understanding what that means in the same article. Jones asks of Robert Simon, who, along with his two business partners, had bought the Salvatore Mundi at auction in 2005, why didn't he leave the painting in its raw yet beautiful state after it was stripped down? Wasn't that an incredible object in itself? Simon's response is, the painting was powerful as it was without further treatment. 
We considered leaving it, considered more limited restoration, as well as a more extensive one. These were not casual decisions, he insists. Part of our final decision was made with the understanding that to leave the painting raw would inevitably cause viewers to focus on the losses and not on what survived. In the end, we decided to do what we felt was best for the picture. That might sound false or corny, but it was out of a profound respect for the painting itself that we felt that bringing it back to life as much as possible was the right way to go. It's clear here that there were two possible paths, leaving the painting in its raw state or an ambitious restoration project, the aim of either of which was to showcase the several artifacts painted by Leonardo's own hand. Simon cleverly obfuscated the restoration process as bringing the painting back to life. So there is still some unraveling to do here to get at the simple truth of the matter. Enter our old associate Bill Heydrich to clear things up with quite a good analogy. My criticism of the restoration is that I find there's, there's a slight awkwardness in the face of Christ. I would make it somewhat akin to musical performance, where let's say you have Yo-Yo Ma as a guest artist with a not particularly outstanding symphony orchestra. Well, should you just let Yo-Yo Ma play by himself and let the symphony not play that's not quite as good as he is, or do you let them all play together and try to evoke something that's suggestive of what was there before? And I guess thinking that way, it becomes sort of okay to go this route. There's not the greatest intellectual justification for it. It's just, I would say this is the way paintings tend to be restored. They tend to go in the direction of, it's gonna be hard for the lay person to tease out uh, what's Leonardo and what's not. And there you have it, the elephant in the room. If the painting looks weird, amateurish, or like a hodgepodge, that's because it is. The majority of the painting is filler, nowhere near the caliber of Leonardo's talent, but understood by those in the game as merely a backdrop for showcasing the several bits that are authenticated as by the master's own hand. If some sections are obviously uneven, botched, ham-fisted, or even cringeworthy, well, that's unfortunate, but can be overlooked if they allow the preserved original sections of the picture to shine through. The problem, however, is that it is the majority of the painting, including the most important parts, the eyes and the face, that are compromised, patched together, third-rate filler. And it's only really the fringes on the periphery that show the master's true touch. I don't mean to suggest that the Salvatore Mundi is anywhere near as bad as the infamous restoration Cecilia Jimenez executed on a fresco of Jesus. That would seem cruel and insulting. However, it is on the same continuum. This was an incredibly powerful image and it was like nothing that I've ever worked on and I believe like nothing that's ever been painted. The Emperor's New Canvas. What I'm saying here is not a profound insight, it's not conspiracy theory, not controversial, and not even particularly original. I'm just saying what's plainly obvious to the trained eye and what all the experts know or should know. The painting was too damaged to restore, they did it anyways, and the results are goofy. And here we have a perfect instance of the Emperor's new clothes. Everyone must get in line and admire the comparative travesty as a Leonardo masterpiece. Comically unflattering anatomical errors are transformed into radical innovations so weird or spooky that only Leonardo could have achieved them. People fawn over the eyes and face that were so damaged, experts couldn't even attribute them to any artist, and which restoration only made worse. But it is not entirely their fault. Christie's marketed the whole of the painting as a spectacular example of Leonardo at his ultimate. They called it the last da Vinci and the male Mona Lisa. They said it was, without question, the greatest artistic discovery of the 21st century. 
a masterpiece. There was a broad consensus that the painting was by Leonardo, even if only two out of five experts would confirm it in the most cited viewing. Suddenly, Leonardo's later works are known for an uncanny strangeness, in which case tragic flaws become the virtuoso flourishes average mortals can't quite fathom. Quote, the execution of Christ's face and hands is entirely new in the history of painting and unique to the peculiar genius of Leonardo. That sentence is an astounding insult to Leonardo. The conspicuous limitations of Diane Modestini's draftsmanship are now worshipped as the most transcendent and extravagant achievements of Leonardo's own genius. But there's more. The flawless, almost divinely beautiful face that emerges mysteriously from the deepest of shadows. The almost supernaturally penetrating eyes, which convey an overwhelming psychological, emotional, and spiritual profundity, have no parallels in Western painting until the creation of the Mona Lisa and the St. John the Baptist. Now, all of art history must be overturned so that the worm tunneling, abrasion due to abrasive solvents, scratches, residual oafish overpainting, warping, and the flaws of a restorer trump everything prior to Leonardo's own final achievements. All of that praise is sheer marketing. It's just a commercial advertisement and not at all surprising. Nobody forefronts the flaws of their product, and apparently, in the case of fine art, the goal is to push the envelope to the extreme of what can legally be claimed. But a business's overflowing praise of their own product should not become synonymous with art history itself, but that's where we are headed if we haven't already arrived and taken a seat. The human being is a social animal, and to a very large degree, what constitutes reality is defined by whatever everyone else overwhelmingly believes. Truth is easily vulnerable to being recognized as the most repeated lie. Repetition of an impression creates unconscious association. For example, in the run-up to the 2000 presidential election, after the initial debates between George W. Bush and Al Gore, TV commentators kept stressing that Bush looked presidential. Well, he was wearing a suit, but his facial expressions, as many a cartoonist came to caricature, were so oafish as to appear simian. He was as presidential in appearance as he was articulate with the English language. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. Nevertheless, the phrase, looks presidential, was repeated so frequently that I noticed in myself that when I heard that set of words, an image of George W. Bush materialized in my mind. I didn't agree with the opinion, which was obvious partisan political manipulation, but the association was still cemented in my memory. And the same thing is happening with this botched transformation of a possible Leonardo original. Slowly, as the assertions of authenticity are reinforced and appear ubiquitous, naysayers are backpedaling, and the art community in general has learned to parrot cherry-picked arguments from art historians for hire and accept over-the-top sales pitches as the indelible fabric of art historical verity. Even I am starting to subconsciously associate a tumorous nose, crossed eyes, chipmunk cheeks, a cabbage patch doll simpering mouth, and a jaw that could double as a clothes iron with a sublime craft of incomparable genius. The Kool-Aid is starting to look and smell good, but my disgust is still greater. My aesthetic sensibility, my respect for the craft of draftsmanship, and my visual intelligence recoil in horror when confronted with this pathetic portrait. The art world tells me I must worship it as the height of artistic perfection by the greatest artist who ever lived. 
Even more, it is not just a depiction of Christ, but a manifestation of his divine presence. Rather, if it's not the emperor's dong proper, it's his codpiece. is the moment you've all been waiting for. It's time for our main event of the evening. I've traveled all the way from Mars to see the new Salvatore Mundi with my own eyes. This is about as far as I could take it within reason. It is the imprint in the sand from where I finally collapsed from exhaustion and face planted. It's not that bad though if I were to tell the truth and I've been known to tell the truth on occasion. To get to this stage I needed to have some background and conventional skills in drawing and painting. Photo editing skills alone wouldn't cut it, and neither would restoration skills alone when it came to the physical painting. You could be a superb art restorer without being able to draw or paint. It's not really required in most instances. And besides which, you shouldn't be adding your own personal touches and segueing away from the artist's original intent. However, in this instance, the restorer had no choice but to go beyond simple repairing and into the much more treacherous waters of recreating missing areas. And if I didn't know any better, and I don't, I'd say she finished the painting to the best of her ability without being able to draw or paint and without an artist's eye. The cumulative effect of such an extensive undertaking in which a non-artist reworks the overall impression of an old master painting and the complete real estate of the surface is that the painting has lost something it used to have in the raw, clean state. An integral sense of anatomy, perspective, modeling, lighting and shading, and foreshortening. For a lot of people, it's not as obvious what's wrong with a painting until you show them a more correct version, and if the differences are rather conspicuous, it highlights the problems of the original. People like to compare and contrast, and you don't even need to speak English to get a lot of information and analysis from just such a juxtaposition. The colors can be misleading because of the different lighting of the photographs, in which case it's useful to take a look at the black and white versions. Would an original Leonardo Salvatore Mundi look like my recreation? Maybe in the same ballpark, in the same city, or on the same planet, but his would be far superior and much more distinct. And as I wrote when I shared my claimed version on the Reddit art history subreddit before I was banned, I guarantee no physical paintings will be harmed in my humble attempt to recreate something along the lines of the original. There are doubtlessly other digital artists and various experts more qualified and better trained for the task. Whatever they are waiting for in the interim, I don't see why not give it a try. I can later be embarrassed by a more consummate effort. I endeavored to do as little interpretation as possible. The biggest change was to the eyes, though I didn't invent my version. They are, rather, the result of superimposing eyes from other versions of the Salvator Mundi on top in semi-transparent layers and then blending and accentuating as needed to arrive at something I found suitable. 
This kind of approach is true for the rest of the image. It is based on several of the extant Salvatore Mundi paintings and trying to get at an original that is to my eye more convincing. I relied primarily on the raw state of the one that is presumed to be by Leonardo, but for the severely damaged areas, I tried to get clues from his students and followers. I even used the Wenceslas holler etching to help me with a sleeve. I expanded out the composition to match the less awkwardly cropped Ganet version. If anyone has a problem with my decision to do that, consider that I can and have simply cropped it back in another version so you have the option of seeing either composition. There's a lot of controversy revolving around the orb in Christ's left hand, which I haven't addressed so far, whether it's solid or hollow, glass or crystal. Would Leonardo have accurately painted the distortions caused by the orb, or would he have used artistic license to underplay them in order to not distract from the Christ figure itself? One need not even probe that deep, and some of those questions may be unanswerable. Leonardo would, however, have painted the orb as not merely round, but as a sphere, and so I tried to make it more spherical and base my orb on one of the other Salvatore Mundi paintings. Did the Christ figure have a beard and mustache or not? The Wenceslas Holler etching clearly depicts him with a beard, but Diane Modestini says that there wasn't a trace of a beard or mustache to be found anywhere in the actual painting. This recreation has been exceedingly difficult for me, it's not something I normally do, and because it was a tightrope act. I had to try to make it look like the original painting, like a da Vinci painting. I had to make it realistic, yet look like a realistic painting, not a photograph. And also I had to make it look like Jesus. In the visual arts, for the discerning eye, I like to point out that the proof is in the pudding. My version may or may not resonate with your own sensibility. It does succeed at elucidating the problems with the physical restoration, ultimately. However, as faithful as I tried to be to original sources, my version is an interpretation in another medium, and it even shades into an original work of art. It provides an alternative vision of how the original might have looked, and in so doing undermines the physical restoration as an inevitable and unavoidable outcome. But it does veer perceptibly from the very specific persona of the raw state of the physical painting, which is, as it should be, the best and most vital version. I'm not getting paid for my digital recreation, my arguments, research, or this video. I'm certainly not being bankrolled by an auction house but I am making prints available at bargain basement prices. Now, virtually anyone can afford to have their own Salvatore Mundi, as resurrected by yours truly, for tens of dollars, not hundreds of millions, in a beautiful archival print. Link in the description. If you've watched the video this far, you may wonder why more people aren't speaking out, refusing to drink the Kool-Aid, and instead standing up for Leonardo, his legacy, artistic integrity, and art itself. Surely not everyone thinks those wonky eyes are almost supernaturally penetrating, that they convey an overwhelming psychological, emotional, and spiritual profundity and have no parallels in Western painting until the Mona Lisa. It's apparently sacrilege to criticize the painting, and if you do so, you will be excommunicated, or worse, humiliated in the public square. Short of those hyperbolic eventualities, are there some sorts of real-world consequences, repercussions, punishments? that will be meted out should you dare not march in lockstep, regurgitating the official art narrative catchphrases on cue? Jerry the Salty Dog Salts said as much in a Vulture article of 2017. It's worth reading the whole paragraph so one has the context of Jerry's perspective. Besides which, it's got some zingers.
This kind of salesmanship is an old game, pure and simple greed, an irresponsible knowing flimflam that defrauds a mass audience into thinking it's appreciating an old master when it's all smoky spectacle and mirrors. Whew, the kid gloves are off. To continue, one of the first things you'll hear from a Christie's official is, the only way to know what this painting is worth is to bring it to auction. This is patently untrue. Were this a real da Vinci, its worth would be something known in the collective culture. The idea that the best test of a painting is to place it under the hammer at auction simply tells you how out of touch Christie's has become. But it's also a sign of a new system of authority. A sad sign of how much power the auction houses have acquired that one of them is pushing a new work by an old master, a work that some experts accept while many others are highly skeptical of, and yet no furor has been raised. And here's where he gets to the looming prospect of retribution, should one have the temerity to articulate any reservation about the painting. Those experts are probably thinking, well, scholarship changes every 20 years and others will correct this, not wanting to rock the already splintering institutional boat. As in the wider world where people sit by for fear of losing position, it's no wonder that many old master experts are keeping quiet, not saying much of anything. And of course, no one at Christie's can say, wait a minute guys, I know many of the people there, all are as passionate and knowledgeable about art as anyone I know. But if any of them think anything is fishy, they're all too far in now to risk losing their jobs by saying anything publicly, when the mood is, nothing is going to change anyway, and that train has already left the station. Well, there it is. People in the industry are frightened of losing their jobs or positions if they publicly question the quality or authenticity of the painting. And he's not the only one that says this. Big Bill Heydrich has come to similar conclusions. Take it away, Bill. I will also say that two of the people who, in a sense, voted against it, Hugo Chapman, Carmen Bomback, two of the greatest scholars of this sort of thing, neither one will say much, and that's probably at the behest of legal counsel. Mm. Uh, for them to come out and damn a work of art like this, it's no longer worth hundreds of millions of dollars. It's worth maybe $20,000. And people in the past have been sued. So they're not gonna reveal their notes on why everything that they disagree with that attribution. This substantiates Saltz's claim that many old master experts are keeping quiet, not saying much of anything, but adds the reason why. They face being crushed by Christie's legal team. Meanwhile, we know from Martin Kemp that Christie's hired him to promote the Salvatore Mundi, presumably after his initial endorsement, and he is one of the two experts to have authenticated the painting out of the five originally consulted. In effect, art history is being written and rewritten by powerful art businesses, in this case Christie's, in order to bolster the value of their own products and acquisitions. Any overlap between the pieces they promote to the pantheon of art history and those which true art connoisseurship would place there may be merely coincidental. When you have a winner, you don't need to cheat, in which case the stuff that gets strong-armed into the art history books tends to be the duds. Here's my conclusion in a nutshell or at least a coconut shell. One, I really like the painting in the raw, clean state, where you can tell what is damage and what is the original paint or what's left of it. Two, even if the painting was originally 100% by Leonardo, which I do not deny, it isn't anymore by a long shot. Three, the current state of the painting is not a restoration to the original state or anything near it. Most of the face remains highly damaged and distorted. It is preserved, but not restored. The restorer merely patched and fudged the damaged pieces together as best she could in order to give the appearance of a seamless whole and a complete painting. It isn't any such thing. A sad outcome of this is that the lighting, shading, 
focal point and overall modeling are either absent or botched, in which case the figure looks like a cardboard cutout belabored by a weed whacker. 4. Because the painting is presented and marketed as a fully restored, complete, 100% Leonardo original, the heavy damages that still remain and the ham-fisted retouching of the restorer are obscenely credited not only to Leonardo da Vinci himself, but as reflecting his skills at their absolute finest, only rivaled by his other latest paintings and superior to anything prior in Western art history. I guess Diane Modestini is one hell of a painter. 5. The original paint may be by Leonardo. The hand is fine, as are some of the curls. But the face, in particular, as we see it now, does not represent his vision, style, or skill by any stretch of the imagination. Rather, it is a cringe-worthy disaster that is the collaboration between 500 years of damage and an art historian restorer's fledgling attempts at old master level virtuoso painting. Among other things, you needed to be an expert at modeling in order to pull this off. The painting is Humpty Dumpty after all the king's horses and all the king's men put him back together again. He is still Humpty Dumpty. Forensics will show us it's the same eggshell, even the yolk, but not as God intended him. And this painting, by weight and forensic analysis, as a physical object, may be overwhelmingly by Leonardo. However, the actual art of it, what we can see on the surface, is a cruel and grotesque mockery of his talent, genius, and technical ability. But let's put words aside because we are talking about visual art, visual language, and visual communication. Ultimately, you access art with your eyes, not through conclusions forged in sentences. Not through thinking about it, but through looking at it. There's a little test that digital artists do, which is to flip the canvas we are working on so that we can see the mirror image. This forces us to see it with fresh eyes, and the flaws we'd become accustomed to and grown to accept become starkly clear. And so here's a purely visual test for you. For an instant, you will see the face afresh, and this will give you an opportunity to trust your own eyes your own aesthetic sensibility, and your own visual intelligence. Are you ready? You be the judge. Is this a flawlessly beautiful face? Are the eyes almost supernaturally penetrating? And do they convey an overwhelming psychological, emotional, and spiritual profundity? Or does it look like the referee should have stopped the fight several rounds ago? And that's putting it very nicely. I've seen a lot of fights and I've never seen anyone get that messed up. As for my own version, well, I think it's a lot less insulting to Leonardo. I don't think he'd be spinning quite as fast in his grave as if on a rotisserie. And I hope you like it. I'd like to give a special thanks to my supporters through Patreon and my other generous contributors who have helped me continue to make art, videos, and write articles during the time of COVID. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and if you're feeling particularly enthusiastic, become a patron 